Mas. Cool. Um, I am so happy to, uh, gosh, uh, present our uh, our speaker today, Michael Janis, uh, co-director of the Washington Glass School. Uh, I feel fortunate enough to have shown with Michael, and it's probably some of the more, I don't know, exciting or uh, I'm not sure the right words to describe showing an art fair, nerve wracking. Um, not say pleasant times, but I've enjoyed our conversations and uh, uh, getting to know Michael over the years. Um, his work kind of falls in line with some of the ideas that we are exploring within the Art Clinic Online uh, series about uh, identity and uh, people and emotions, and, you know, where your art comes from. So I, I'm really excited that somebody who normally speaks for such prestigious crowds as the Smithsonian and the uh, American Glass Guild uh, has uh, lowered himself to our tiny little organization. Um, but I, I would like to say thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing uh, everything you have to say today. So thank you, Michael. Uh, Jordan, thank you. And Mariana, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this. Uh, you know, I, I like encouraging anything to do with the arts and, and when it is in my own backyard, even more so, because I always feel as though DC is overlooked as being an art producing area that they always look to other areas and say DC is just one note, which is political. And unfortunately, in these days, the wrong political uh, sentiments come out of it. So it is nice to kind of do anything I can to burnish the uh, art background of the district or the DMV. I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me as I figure out what buttons I'm clicking. Share and then go to from start. Okay. And I'm just going to turn. Okay, I'm, I'm titling this thing Drawing Parallels because I wanted to say that I'm doing something that's kind of like painting, but it's really not. And it's really, I, I do explore a more painterly aspect in my uh, glass work than uh, other people do, but that's because I've, I've come from a different background. You know, I was, I was born in Chicago in the Midwest and, and now I realize it was a multiracial family because my mother is Chinese, Filipino, and Spanish. And as a kid, I was always quite well aware of my uh, racial ethnic backgrounds were different than the other kids in suburban Chicago. But, and so I've always incorporated that into my work is, is concepts of identity and how we fit in. And I, I wanted to be an artist when I was a kid but my parents were not, um, they were not that interested and they, they did not think that you could make a living at that. So they encouraged me to find something else and architecture was something that they thought was more acceptable for a kid that you could, at least they understood that, that there could be a career at that. So I had become an architect in Chicago and uh, I was working on different projects that had very much the Chicago aesthetic, the Mestian, Bauhaus, clean lines, very thoughtful. Craftsmanship was a very important part of it. You would have to know how to draw lines, how to how bricks worked before you could really design with it. So it was a very refined aesthetic. In um, the late 80s, a Australian architecture firm had been borrowing concepts from my wife's uh, architectural thesis on ultra tall buildings. So they came to Chicago to recruit her and they interviewed her and she said, it's great. She'd love to come to Australia, but she's married to an architect. And they said, okay, we got a job for him too. So I went to Australia and I was an architect there for 10 years in the sunny city of Brisbane, Australia. And was there for the Sydney Olympics. I worked on some of the developments in, uh, for that. I worked on projects all across Australia and New Zealand. And while I was working in Australia, I started working with glass. Sometimes they have a strong glass background in Australia. And I was using glass to make a whole lobby wall of cast glass. Uh, when I had done work for the British consulate in Brisbane, I was doing the whole uh, state seal in, in cast glass. And that's where I started uh, being asked to come to the studios. And once I saw how they worked with glass, I wanted to work with it more. 
after 9-11, my wife had said, it's time to move back to the U.S. And I said, I'm happy to move back, but I want to get out of architecture because I found it to be something where I just spent time working on budgets and construction schedules and less about the art part of architecture. And I said, can I change my career and become an artist? And she said, oh, if you think you can make a living at it, sure. So I came back to the US and we came to the DC area in Virginia. And then um, I started educating myself. So I went to all the different places that I could get glass. So that's at Haystack Mountain in, in uh, Maine and Penland in North Carolina, Urban Glass in New York. And also I came into the Washington Glass School. And at the Washington Glass School, I became the shop monkey and I worked every day and I set up the studio, assisted on every one of the classes. I uh, pretty much threw myself in to say, I got to learn everything I can as fast as I can. And even assisting, I learned a lot. I became a co-director in 2005 as as Tim Tate, who's the founder of the Glass School, would say, I shamed them into being a partner here. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a history of what the Washington Glass School is. The Glass School was located in the district, but with the coming of the Nationals in 2005, we got kicked out and we ended up in Mount Rainier, Maryland, which is on the just over the Eastern Avenue edge of uh, the district. So we're on the Maryland Prince George's side and it's not the most glamorous spot in the area, but it is a very welcoming spot for artists. We do have a lot of artists who work from this area around us. And we also work at, at teaching people in glass techniques here. It's not a blowing studio. It's more of a kiln fusing studio. So it's things that you can put in kilns and melt. And that's how we work with glass. And you have a lot of people who apply themselves a little bit more uh, of a utilitarian. They're making bowls, they're making lights, they're making tables. And they're also encouraging them, the students to take it and find your voice and tell things that are a little bit more of yourself. And it, it is kind of nice to work with a lot of people in different techniques and have people who are uh, bringing different points of view. We have a lot of experimentation here. They're working with uh, silk screening with enamels on glass. That's uh, uh, Terry uh, Swinhart and Patricia DePaul Wilberg working in the studio. And it is kind of nice to have a whole community working on glass and taking artists who normally work in another medium, like this guy here is normally a uh, muralist and a uh, street muralist at that. So the idea that they're exploring different mediums and incorporating that into their artwork is really a nice thing. And we have a lot of equipment here that you need specifically for glass, to chop glass, to grind glass, to polish it, all the kind of things that you need that our studio is part of. So we have a lot of people who work from the studio and start, uh, it allows us by having our own community in-house, we can start working on larger projects. Like this was one of the shots when we had a community uh, glass quilting bee. So we had a whole neighborhood where we're doing public art come in to make the artwork. And sometimes you can't work by yourself in your studio. You need the help of someone else that lets you go on and make the artwork. And we also have a lot of people come by, like this is Nora Atkinson from the Runwick's uh, uh, gallery coming in to see the artwork that's in our studio. And we also have them come around and see what's going on with any of the artists that are working here at the time. And you never know who comes in. It could be any celebrity might just pop in and be surprised by what they see. I mean, you just never know what's gonna happen. I am gonna talk a little bit about my technique and it's a uh, scraffito is what I call it. And what I'm doing is I'm sifting really fine crushed glass. So it's black glass that's a consistency of confectionery sugar or, or baker's flour. And I push it around with an exacto. And the densities of darker becomes the heavier lines in it. So that's how I work on a piece. That is what I, I do to make my imagery. So it is frit powder on, on sheets of glass that are fired in. And, and I'm gonna take you through a whole setup. So if I'm doing one piece, I start with a concept sketch that lets me know where placement will be. 
I'll start firing the main elements first so I can have a relationship. And as I work on it, I keep on going back and forth saying, I, I have another la layer. So think about depth and sequence of images. And then once I fire each of them individually, I'll stack them up into the kiln and then fire it all together into a solid slab. So it is a multi-step process that I'm putting together, going backwards and forwards and registering each one each time I do it. And then there's the final firing inside a kiln. And that will give me something that when you melt the glass together, it kind of shifts everything and it has a different feel to it and a different quality because it's now all been mushed together at 1500 degrees and cooked for a process that takes for the final firing about 20 hours inside a kiln. And that's to go up and to come down. Uh, with this, it lets me start telling stories with it. So I had done for uh, a few years ago, uh, a modern take on the modern tarot, where I wanted to just say that these kind of playing cards really gives a story. It, it's it's a, a thing that you divine what is going to happen. So it's inherently got a narrative to that imagery. And I wanted to make it contemporary American stories with it. And I, I like the idea of working in series. So I'm constantly telling one story that has a dialogue with another piece. And I'm also going to talk about a lot of the images. I like making stories into pieces. So they tell a piece inside. And, and I often get asked, who's the subject? Who's the model? And when I started out, I would have my wife be the model because she's an artist and she understood what placement was and she was available and cheap. And she would say, sure, I'll pose, drop off the clothes, sure. And it's fine. And, and I would change the imagery so you don't really know it's her. And you know, I could use that in a lot of my pieces until someone had seen a male nude and said, is this also okay? And I would say, oh, there's things you don't know about her that I'm exploring within the artwork. I'm also at that age where a lot of family members are passing away. And because I'm the artist, they give me all the old images and photographs and saying, you can do something with that. And, and I like that because these are beautiful images that are something that I'm saying, they're very inspiring. They, they make a very thoughtful uh, connection to a past of mine and I can abstract it enough that it becomes a storytelling thing and it saves that image in a sense forever. So sometimes I can be very literal about how the image is and sometimes just something that gives an indication of what the story was that I perceived within that family member and, and I can start telling something a little bit more evocative with that piece. And I do like arranging the panels so that if I'm presenting it, it might have a more of an installation feel so that it can, have a, a different quality, but then I'm an artist and I'm also looking to sell. So if I can make something that is a replaceable component, it works as a large installation, as well as being a small enough piece that you can say, if you changed it out to a different image, it still would work. And as an artist, I'm always looking to say, how do I tell a story a little bit different? And I liked anamorphics where you would look into the mirror and see the reflection and it would correct a distorted image. So I started working in a whole series that had a, a, a um, silvered cylinder that you could see the corrected image, but straight on, you just saw it as a distortion. And I really loved the distortions. I actually said that the distortions were more interesting than the fixed image. And I actually started saying, let me get rid of this thing that fixes it and make you always have to look at the stretched image because I think it let a different way into the, to what you saw. I'm also sometimes saying, well, I'm working with a glass as a medium. So tell me, why is it glass? Why am I using glass instead of painting? Why am I using this material instead of ceramics? And some of glass is just being pretty sexy. It's a sexy material. It is something that as a artist medium, you have to know technical information because you have annealing issues, you have coefficients of expansion, you have all sorts of issues that are not just straightforward where you go in and use it. And that's where I'm gonna go backwards and forwards and saying I'm sometimes just being a technical nerd and sometimes I'm just gonna be saying, how do I tell a story? And I do like always going backwards and forwards and saying, how do I mix the two to be one story that 
has all those aspects as part of it. I was once asked uh, by the contemporary craft in Pittsburgh to be part of their uh, mental health show. They wanted artists to explore how to address aspects of mental health. And they were doing a full on show called Mindful. And it was a show where I, I was one of the artists, I was a glass artist, and I did a, a series on this. And just to talk about how images can take a life of their own, this image I had allowed on Wikipedia to be uh, one of the wiki images. And I now see it in shows about communism, about uh, healthcare, about anything to do with something different than what the original show was. They will just use this because it's now out there in the uh, internet universe. And so I'm quite happy to have it just kind of go forward. I also started doing a series about uh, that involved cast glass and the imagery. And I wanted to kind of balance the idea that you can't quite see or understand who the person is because the cast elements will block it. And it's, it's kind of an abstraction of it. It takes it away from being a straightforward portrait and it makes it something more where the glass that are cast elements are adding something to it by being uh, the, a thing that light goes through it. You can kind of see through it, but you're kind of obscuring it. And, and I just like the way that it switched up a straightforward uh, portrait. And when I'm talking about making these cast elements, there is a lot that goes into making all those dimensional flowers. You know, you start with a clay form that you originally make, and then you make a mold around it, and then you pour wax into it. And then you have the wax element that you can pour plaster around it and melt out the wax. And this is where our, our stu uh, studio coordinator, Audrey Wilson, working on making a lot of molds. And she would then have to steam out the wax and that gives you two of these that I can then have glass go into there, melt it in a kiln, and then I've got those elements that I can chop out and use in my artwork. But it's a very labor intensive. For one panel, I'll be needing hundreds of these flowers. And sometimes Audrey was not excited by that task. So it becomes a, a chore, but I really like the quality they gave and the way that light, when you lit it properly, it really added a color and dimension to it. And it had a different quality that when you walked around it, you really kind of get glimpses between each of the flowers to the object below, the figure below. So I actually had done a whole series based on these. And, and really the thought process was Darwin's, uh, Erasmus Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's grandfather, talked about earlier thoughts about pollination. He talked about the love life of plants and that that was where you had the selection by, based on the attractiveness, the prettiness, the qualities that get, draw, drew you in to pollinate. And I'm saying these are the things that these beautiful, hyper beautiful people were gonna be. I actually started exaggerating whatever my figure was that I started with. I made the lips bigger, the eyes bigger. I just made them so attractive and then I covered them up. So to me, that was part of the, the enjoyment of the piece was denying you seeing what these people look like. But then I also like the qualities of, you know, people would say, but the most expressive quality is the eyes and you're blocking them. So I started slowly shifting up where you started seeing more of the eyes and I like that quality too. And some of these, I just started focusing on other aspects besides the figure would be saying like that dress that that I want to have the sheerest of fabric that you can see through because I am working with layers of glass I can see through to the layer below it so I wanted to have a gauzy feel to it and I also started working bigger these start being about almost four feet across and I worked in multi-panels so now I had the scale of three and a half feet by three and a half feet to be a larger, more dynamic scale to the piece. But when you're working glass, what could possibly go wrong? Well, you know, glass does break, even though I'm working with heavy chunks of glass, things happen. And, you know, it can be even at the show where someone will knock over a thing and, it, and when it hits the ground, that there is usually a sad ending to it. 
And even when I'm working in my frit powder, all it takes for me is to bump the piece and what was a nice series of flowers now has a, a glass frit powder cap skittle across it and I have to dump off all the powder for that whole day and start over. And I have done pieces where I've gone into the kiln and a fly that was buzzing around lands in the middle of my powder drawing backwards and starts sputtering around and buzzing around. And all I can do is close the kiln and turn on the program and say, now that is a looser interpretation of what that image will be. And I can only imagine from the movie, The Fly, that it's Jeff Goldberg saying, help me. Wow. We also had kiln incidents where the kilns with the relays will stuck, get stuck. And it just goes off on, off on. That's what a kiln relay does for the computer program. But if it gets stuck on on, it's cooking for hours. This one, I came in in the morning and it had been cooking for 18 hours straight at highest possible temperature. Well, the whole interior had collapsed because of the intense heat and the long firing. All the elements had dropped into my piece. So the inset there was what was in the kiln. And here is what I came to the next day. It was completely destroyed. The kiln was out of action for months as we had to rebuild the whole structure. So you do, when you close the kiln door, you have to do a little dance to the kiln gods to hope that it turns out. That's why I'm always saying, if you can work on it without firing it, that makes it much safer. But I am going to take you back to say, this is what I'm doing for a piece. I had done a whole series where I really wanted to kind of celebrate uh, an image of a woman and almost say there's a quality, there's a presence to them. There's almost a, a vibrational presence that you can just get within the image. So as I work on an image, I'm starting from the baseline saying, I'm gonna work on the features and then just develop it each time. So every one of these is a separate firing to kind of build up an image in the density that I want. At some point, I'm gonna start adding colors to it and I'm gonna be firing it each time and saying, okay, now where do I really need to focus on? And sometimes it'll be aspects of the hair. Sometimes it'll be the clothes. It'll be just something that is different that I'm gonna be working on. So as you see in the kilns, every one of these firings could have ended in disaster. So you cross your fingers each time. And if it works out well, on to the next firing. And I also wanted to have almost like a vibration that's visible. So I started doing these outside elements that you just are, uh, seeing almost a vibrational quality to that piece. And this was the final firing piece. And I had done a whole series of it. So it really had when you saw it in grouping and, and the centerpiece was actually bought by the DC commission. And the other two pieces are right now in Toronto at a show. Michael, when you uh, typically do a, a multiple layered kind of piece, do you have an average number of layers to it? Or is it kind of you decide halfway through or three fourths way through how many layers are necessary for the piece to be finished? Well, I let the piece evolve and I will usually do my initial sketch says, this is where I'm gonna be ultimately going for. So I'll know what one's a top layer, what one's a lower layer, the thicker I made it and I have gone to five or six layers thick. The glass is stupid heavy. And that's the bad thing about it is you, you worry about a long span because my pieces in these series that you're seeing, they're about three feet high. So that's a good height and they're about 20 inches wide. So you don't want glass to flex because it usually ends badly. And that's why I put a steel frame around it and I mount it that way. So it's got the additional support of the steel. So now you're getting steel and a heavy piece of glass. Once you start saying that my artwork piece, one panel is around 25 pounds, you have people saying, well, how do I hang this on a, a hook? So I had to actually come up with a mounting system and, and suggest the anchors that would go into to say it can handle this kind of weight. So that is a thing where I say, I don't want it to be too many layers. Simpler is better. And that if I can do it with say two or three layers, I'm golden. So I'll try and work it that way. But there are times when I'm layering an image inside the kiln that as I do my final layer, I say, I don't like the elements, something's wrong and I'll pull it all apart. I am in a shared studio. So sometimes 
I have someone or a class coming in the kiln. I only have so many kilns that can handle this size piece. So that becomes an issue as to what, how is that going to mess up a class or someone else who signed up for that kiln. And as much as I like being the director that says my saying my stuff comes first, I don't always have that luxury if there's a class. So we do have a brand new kiln, which you can see behind me. I think if I go that way, you can see that there's a huge kiln that we just got. And that lets me fire three of these panels at one time. So I am enjoying it right now. So I'm again, knocking on Formica before anything happens and that kiln starts falling apart. And Michael, what, what part of your training helps you to um, form the steel structures exactly the way you need them and to repair kilns? <clears throat> For both of those, I go to my business partner, Erwin Timmers, because he actually was a metal artist when he and Tim founded the studio. So his welding class gives a lot of information. I, I took welding classes and ultimately I decided that I am more a glass artist than a steel artist. And ultimately I actually contracted out my steel framework to uh, George Anderton to make them. And he can just supply me with steel framework and then I can focus on the glass. I have learned that it's best to have the steel frame there and measure that frame rather than the drawings that I sent him and find out that I'm off by a quarter of an inch because I'd rather make it to fit that size. Uh, oh, one of those things I learned from hard knocks uh, is that you don't want to trim off an edge of glass that's a eighth of an inch. Uh, you can, but it's going to be more involved. And it's just, again, puts it at risk that something will go wrong and there'll be a big chunk that'll come out and then, then you'll be sad. And that sad face is never good. Uh, and in my works, I'm going to go back uh, and I, I'm fine with having questions. If you just want to throw them out, that's good. Uh, I don't think that there's a problem for time. Um, so I'm just going to keep on going. Uh, I, I want it to be a little bit more abstract with my works. I mean, there is something where I like to say that when it starts looking like a straightforward portrait, people are get only invested as to what the subject is. And to me, that's just part of it. I like the way the look is. I like being drawn into the piece. I like to say that the figure is only going to be something where the, their gaze or their aspects of it can be balanced out as part of the composition. So I actually wanted to go very abstract with it and let the glass really be as wild as possible, where I'm making these kind of, uh, uh, of, a, of a bubble pattern glass that I fire on top of it. I'm going to be using enamels on top. I'm going to be using colored glass that is cut into shapes and just really what make the image a lot wilder, a lot more uh, interactive in terms of the imagery. And, and if I need to be taking in using instead of black fret, blue fret, then I'll use it that way. And just it just gives it a much more of a painterly quality where I'm letting it almost dissolve into the imagery. And sometimes I will actually just start referencing people like Baldessari. And, and I like the whole idea that the conceptual quality of, of blocking an element on the uh, figure makes you wonder more about what's going on and what the story is. And in some of the pieces I've actually been really abstracting out and taking the formal image and chopping up pieces of glass that I made and firing them on to give a different feel to it and just start telling the story differently because I'm I'm working with it and then covering it up in a sense. And, and I had done a whole series, again, that whole concept that I can do an installation feel. And, and that was one of the shows that I was at that Jordan was mentioning at, at art fairs. Art fairs are exhilarating, but they're also nerve wracking because if you're getting a negative response or zero response, then you're going to be packing it all up and moving it away. And that was one of my worries at a show in Chicago where a gallery, Maureen Littleton in town here in DC, if she doesn't sell you, then she's less likely to take you to the next show. So you're always kind of biting your nails saying, can I sell a piece? And I, I know at one of the shows, I didn't sell anything. And I was given the prime spot on the main aisle and I didn't sell a damn thing. So I thought, oh my God, she'll never carry me. And that was it. Oh, I enjoyed it. It was good run. And the last, it was 5.30, the show ends at six on the Sunday night where you, already people are starting to pack up. 
a guy came in and said, I'll take all of them, all my panels. And I'm like saying, but the caveat was he has a dinner party at seven. So they need to be installed at his house up on Lakeshore Drive. So can you throw them in the trunk and, dry, and can I help install? Well, I'm yes about, we won't throw it into a trunk, but yes, we can install it. So I called up my wife and I said, you got to help me carry these things because I'm going to put it on your lap in the back of his Jag. And, and, you know, so they don't bounce around in the trunk. And we go up Lakeshore Drive and we pull into his uh, house and he points over the staircase and says, I want it on the wall opposite uh, the landing of the stairs. So I'm saying, well, do you have an articulated ladder that lets me put a ladder up on stairs to hang it there? And he goes, no, can't you use a regular ladder? I said, well, you do have the steps here. And he was saying, well, we can go to a hardware store. I'm saying, a hardware store in Chicago on a Sunday at six, it's gonna be hard to find anything like that. So he ultimately was fine with me just putting it up in a bedroom, one of the guest bedrooms so he can show his guests. But that to me has always been my sofa miracle where, I, and when you walk down the aisle and have all the other show galleries turning to see where you're going as you march out with large panels is a high point of my uh, show fair uh, techniques. And I'm gonna- Those are absolutely gorgeous. Ah, thank you. I started also wanting to work bigger. So I just started saying, let me cut apart the object and treat it as a four part issue. And so that I like the abstraction, if it only was one panel that it would still read, but the scale that I could go could be quite large. And so I started working with these kind of four part. And I like the idea that I'm deconstructing the image that, that, the, that the person you start seeing is almost disjointed. And I like that whole deconstructed quality to it. And that you start having aspects about that person are reflective of a kind of a troubled state or the fact that we're more than one view of ourselves, that how we are is not exactly how we uh, portray ourselves, that, that our thoughts are different than what we want people to be actually perceiving. So I liked having these kind of multiple images within a person's uh, presentation. Got someone knocking at the door here. So I also work with the enamels to let them almost dissolve off. If I take uh, an alcohol spray, I can have it almost washed down before I fire. And I like that, again, the painterly quality to the artwork. But I always go back, I always feel like I can re revisit something that I had used as a technique. So if I'm going on, I can go back and start adding elements again. So I feel there's no problem in going backwards and forwards. It's, it's all a technique that I've done. And I do like having aspects from one thing that I just say, it's always well worth a revisit to just see what the quality is. So I'm just gonna ignore this guy knocking at the door here. Michael, and for the layering, and especially for the last layer, perhaps where you have three dimensional objects do you mm -hmm. have to fire those two or can you glue them on? Uh, I glue them on. I, I, I am not a purist when it comes to how glass is, I will say. And since one of my studio uh, partners here works, has, has been using the casting techniques and then said the molds will work with uh, what he calls polyvitro. So that's a plastic forming. I will sometimes say, you know, that makes it a lot lighter and a lot more durable in the sense that if someone bumps it, it's not gonna chink off the bit of the glass. So I started exploring some of that. Our studio coordinators become well-versed in mold making. So I just say, can you make me 400 flowers? And, and then we'll talk about what the actual medium will be. I'm gonna just kind of put it on hold for a sec and tell this person to stop. No problem. That's great. I want to ask how thick or thin each layer has to be. Sorry about that. The guy was insisting on pounding on the door because he just drove by and said, I want to see what the school is. Oh, I thought it was Irwin. 
Well, that, that is a, you are in a shared studio. I can't turn it away, but wow. Uh, that's, I love working on the weekends because we tend to have, if there's not a class on, it's a little bit quieter, but you end up still being part of a, a shared event. So. Michael, can I ask you about layering and how thick or thin layers have to be? Well, each of the layers of glass that I work with is about an eighth of an inch thick. So if you layer two of them, you have a quarter inch. If you're saying you have six layers, you're making a slab of glass. And again, glass is heavy. Uh, shifting to plastics is marginally less. If I use a steel frame, that adds a lot of weight. If I use aluminum, it's much lighter. So I'm loving on aluminum. It's just that it's I, I'm set up here in a studio that has metal, so steel welding, not so much aluminum welding. So I had to kind of outsource that. Weight is an issue. Packing artwork is an issue. Um, we, I actually had learned the hard way that if I don't, and I think Lenny touched on that a little bit on his last presentation, that if you find a standard size, your boxes can be bought in bulk at a much lower rate than customized, custom made boxes. And I do have to ship to galleries because Maureen Littleton was a gallery in DC that carried me, but she has moved to North Carolina. So now everything I show it is in another part of the country. That means I have to get this to Detroit or Toronto or Florida. And like, I have to worry about how it's packed. So packing becomes a major issue for this. And that's where I'm, working on is, is saying standard sizes means I can find ready-mades rather than custom-made. Is, is some of the glass that you guys work with recycled? Some of it is. Uh, Erwin Timmers in our studio is the eco-artist extraordinaire. He likes to uh, use, champion using window glass, recycled tempered glass, and that's great. And, and some of my earlier works was because of cost, I use that. If I want the richer colors, if I want the adventurine glass, which has a little bit of sparkle to it, then I'm paying for a craft glass. And the number of manufacturers in this country have dropped dramatically over from 2001 till 2022. Uh, the main manufacturers have either moved out of the country or closed. And actually even some of the fancy glass that we would get from Germany, no longer being carried in the country. So it's just a matter of constantly figuring out how do you work with it. That's why I've also started shifting to a lot of enamel because I know I can get that. But even then the, the premier paint, the enamel that I used was Paradise Paints and they had a fire and it destroyed their entire inventory and they closed. So now I'm finding alternates that are just not quite the same. And you just kind of just go with the flow and say, this is what you got now. And this is how I work with it. A lot of our public art, when we work on that, which I'll talk about in a little bit, we use a mix of the, the fancy glass and recycled glass, because that always becomes a thing that the different um, organizations that contracted us, they, they like that aspect of using recycled glass. And I, I mean, hope I, it's not anathema to ask about plastics in, um, at some point. So you don't have to answer now, but if you have a thought on that. Plastics are fine. I mean, a lot of the qualities of that, especially when you go to the art fairs of which Jordan mentioned at the beginning of our, before we started going online, the art fairs, they don't care. The glass people, when you go to a glass show, yes, they, they are obsessive about it being glass and that you almost be a purist. You go to the art fair, they don't care what it is. As long as it tells a story and it looks cool, they, that's all they care about. Uh, you do have to learn some aspects of it because when you are mixing the chemicals to make that plastic, you can get toxic reactions to it. Um, it is a thing that you really have to know what each property is. I think the clearer it is, the more toxic it is. So the whiter it is, the better it is to breathe. And there's also an environmental issue as well. So there are some of those kind of things that have worked their way through. And, and Tim has become a very knowledgeable of how that is. And so of our studio coordinators, because they work with this on a regular basis. And 
even Dale, Dale Chihuly, who, if you know Glass, that's the one name you probably know. He actually works. He actually is the one who coined the phrase polyvitro because a lot of the stuff, I think, in the Bellagio and the outdoor installations are actually a plastic because of the safety issues. And, and that's where we just said we already have a leg up on a lot of the um, technical information by just seeing how they had used it. And that's, that's, uh, it's good. You, you're always building on the knowledge and saying, where can you take it next? And for, for your own applications. And, and speaking of Tim, I have, he is my studio mate. He, he and Erwin are the partners here. And Tim and I actually have taught classes together. We've taught in Istanbul. And one of the techniques we taught was dry plaster casting when it was a, a, a way to get dimensional casting in glass. And so I work with Tim on a regular basis and Tim can be a lot to deal with. And he, he does have a personality that actually can overwhelm you if you aren't able to uh, handle Tim. You know, a little Tim goes a long way, but working in a collaborative sense has actually been really good because we're focused on telling a story and we each do different things. And then we talk about how an artwork piece can come together. So we, we kind of nut out what the concepts are we each start working on, on the artwork individually, and then we just kind of meet to make an artwork piece. So this is a piece that was shown in Chicago, and we just said it's about memories and longing and relationships. So we had all these kind of things as broad a title as that. We just started saying what would be aspects of that, and I would do some uh, uh, drawing pieces. He would do dimensional cast elements, and we would do combined uh, the, the uh, open face kiln casting, the bar relief. And then we just started telling stories with it that way. And we, we actually found that that was a very, very fruitful one. So we started working on it in different sizes and different places. And we liked the way that we had a dialogue. It really came well. And then I also started working collaboratively with a, a guy I knew in college. And we said, let's really explore pop culture. So we said, let's just do anything that has uh, different references of pop culture. I don't know why Hulk Hogan is staying in front. I guess he really wants to stay in front, but we just said, let's really look at how pop culture can be part of our artwork. So we started doing mixed media assemblages where it was cast glass and found objects and lighting. And we had a show in uh, Habitat Detroit. And also it was part of the show in Miami at Scope. And we just said, let's really make it fun, make it different, make it something that was tongue in cheek, but worked on the aspects of what our artwork would be. Uh, uh, one more question about uh, translating images from pop culture. To what extent do you worry about copyright and, and borrowing the images or do you need permissions for the more accurate one? Well, there is a thing, a law for fair use. Where, where you're taking an image and you're making a statement about it. And since it is not as though Hulk Hogan or Andre the Giant is actually being uh, taken away from any of their benefits, we're making a statement about this culture and about right. this whole con concept of being the aggressive, uh, you know, take, say your prayers, eat your vitamins, that whole machismo kind of thing is a statement we're making. But we're also making it humorous and trying to make it a, a witty statement on it and, and be pretty too. So, so it's there, under fair use and yes. it's another medium. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a wrestling uh, foundation and I'm, it's, it's, I'm using their imagery and translating. There also is a, a, a translation of it. It is not, I have not taken their ads and used them. I'm actually translating the concepts of them. And I actually sometimes use like the whole Testo Boost thing. So I'm using the jars as containers, but it's not about the powder. And, and I'm going to say a little bit about our studio situation. Uh, when we're in a shoot studio like this, we're three artists, but combined, we're able to say that we're a studio and start tackling larger scale projects. And so that was one of the things that my background as an architect let me uh, help out in terms of getting larger and larger scale commissions. So we started working on getting 
public art in the area. This is a arch that we had done for a new healthcare uh, um, facility that's in Ward 7. And we said that uh, they had concerns about damage to public art. We said, then if you're worried about the kids damaging it, have them come in and we're gonna be doing workshops in the studio with all of the community. And then we also started doing things like for the Library of Congress and doing the, the doors for the Library of Congress. And this is the uh, Ward 8, Laurel Library, we had done the artwork for. Uh, in Arlington, we had done, uh, this is just done during the pandemic, they had contracted us to do it. And actually we met with the art consultants at, uh, right before the pandemic in Florida at Miami Beach. And then when it all shut down, they shifted the artwork and said, can it really be on themes of nature and connecting back to nature? It was in an abstracted idiom. So we, we worked with it that way. So there's actually in the top corner of that piece, a little dimensional virus that starts the whole thing off. So I'm gonna say- People what, are you, saying how wonderful, varied and admiring of your work. <laughs> oh, that's good. So. What I'm doing right now, right now I'm part of the, the Venice Biennale at Glass Dress, which is a sister exhibition on there. Tim Tate had been a regular artist there. Uh, he and Chris Shea, who's out in uh, Brandywine, he's a metal artist. We said, let's do something. Tim had invited Chris and I to be part of this. So we now are able to say we're all showing at the Venice Biennale. But he wanted to have a very large scale. He said, as big as we can possibly make it, because you've got to compete with a lot of people there. So we had talked about making a very large uh, round piece that would be cast glass. And we initially looked at aspects of, since it's a round piece, let's, let's say that it's about an eye and viewing and perception. And then we started shifting and saying, let's make it more about climate change. And our studio coordinator at the time was the model for the piece. And that's where I started working on creating imagery to say that this is more about rising levels of ocean and the obliviousness to it. So I wanted to have the figure be just the only one who connects with us where everyone else is marching off unaware of their own situation. And then after a, a series of firings, the title of the piece became, there's a hole in the sky. We changed the way the format would be a bit and then started casting the glass and shipped it off to Venice where it's now installed and had opened, uh, unfortunately timed where I couldn't go and travel to it because it was the same time I was doing an opening in Toronto. But this is a piece with a cast of uh, surround of flowers and dragonflies and bees. So I wanted, uh, the whole concept was about mother earth being swallowed by water. And just to give you a scale, this is actually the Detroit gallery owner had visited in, uh, in uh, Murano. A little bit of the setting of where it is. The actual setting is in a uh, unused glass factory. Incredible. And right now, later on today, I'm gonna to be giving a talk uh, with the Toronto gallery and I'll be going there in a couple of weeks to the to one of the secondary openings. And also um, in contemporary craft, I'm working on a piece for the Founder Prize. I'm one of the finalists and they've asked me that I do a piece based on the four part series, but the theme was transformation. So I just started working with that. And this is our studio coordinator now, Christina where I want it to be all about change and how we are always in a constant state of change so that there is a transformation within that. So this is, a, again, each panel is like a 20 by 40 and there are fused glass and layered imagery with uh, glass powder. And so that you don't see from one layer to the next, I use an enamel that blocks it out. So that's why you see it in, in a kind of a randomized field. And here's my website. And then I'm gonna stop share and see if there's any questions. And that kind of wraps up my story. Jeez, man, not bad. <laughs> uh, I have a question just about you know, making transitions between uh, styles of, of art. Like how do you, how, is, it, is it just a seamless kind of flow from one 
uh, approach to the other? Do you make errors? Are there are like what are what, what are things that pop up that just uh, do you have a writer's block ever? It, just, it doesn't seem like it. Well, I, I do know a lot of people, especially if they stop working for a while, they have a bit of that writer's block that you say. And so to me, the answer is just start just start making something. doesn't matter if it's good or bad. And for me, when I work on a new series, I will have in my mind's eye something I want it to be. Now, I will have to get that out of my system. I have to do it the exact way that I'm doing it all the way through the end. And then I can say, now I can make it the correct way because usually it's not the way I want it to be. And it's usually something wrong, but there's a quality about that piece that led me in that direction. So usually the first one's like, it's, it's like pancakes. The first one might not be the best one, but once you make that, now the things are all set. And it's usually the second one, third one, fourth one, that it's a little bit better in that series. Yeah, there's gonna be ones that never go further than one. And, and I usually start off and I say, I want to at least do three of them. And for a funny thing, when you do figurative work, if you do male and female, for me, I always sell the female ones and I end up with the guy. And so I have all these guy pieces around the studio where I, I will make another female one to be a companion piece and then I'll end up with the guy again. So I must be doing something wrong or the guys are always doing, people don't like guys. I don't know, but I, I understood because I had to have someone question me, why am I always doing female figures? I'm saying those are the successful ones. All the guys I have sitting in the back studio leaning against the wall, and I call them my lonely boys because no one's interested in them. And, and I have had people say, well, you need to sell it to a different market. Go to the, to the gay market. And I think they're still more interested in the women pieces than they are with the male figures. So there is a quality that I'll say. The more androgynous I can make it, perhaps maybe that's the way to go where you don't say, you can see what it is that you want to see within the figure. But yeah, there is going to be a thing when you're testing out ideas, you're going to be, there is an experimental phase. And if it doesn't work, that's what open studio sales are for, to sell them off and say, you know, it, you, you might've learned from it. And again, that's why I say you take a picture of it. You don't need to keep it forever and sell it off. And if not, uh, then there's, if it, if it just stays forever, I've had pieces sit here forever. And I had done a series of, I didn't want them to be nudes as Claudia Rousseau called, where they were a little bit more classically posed. They were, she called them naked. They're just regular people and you would see them without clothes on. And there was a big guy with a pot belly, older guy that someone had said, that looks like Donald Trump before he was president. And I just, they bought everyone around, but that guy. So I put a, a Christmas time at the Christmas <laughs> open studio. I put a big red bow on him. And so you kind of just saw everything around him naked, but the big bow and that one sold because they thought it was the funniest thing they've ever saw. And what a Christmas present. And again, I'm saying it just, you need to wait until you found the right audience and then it sells. Otherwise I would have said he's in the trash at some point. And then I take a picture of him in the trash and say a sad, tragic end. You know, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I well, I just wanted to. I'm new to the group. I'm Linda Kimmel Grant. Mariana and I were in medical school together, and um, I have an interest in art um, to train physicians so that they can uh, actually learn to listen with their eyes. Is my mm -hmm. big thing, which leads me into my question. Your this this work is just absolutely amazing, but. Um, you, your eyes that you create are just so, you know, um, dynamic and telling and striking. I and mean, I'm wondering, I just, as you were talking about the men and the women, I just remember the women's eyes. I don't remember the men's eyes. So maybe that's some, something that you do different <laughs> with the women's yeah. eyes. But I had the experience yesterday at the dentist of, um, you know, had a mask on, everyone had masks on. And I was just able to look at people's eyes. And there was a, a Japanese woman, most gorgeous eyes ever. I'm like, how can I get my fix so I can look like that? And, and then there was an Ethiopian woman and then the dentist himself, you know, but I had never focused on eyes really that much. I mean, I look at, look at them, but, <clears throat> and I just wonder if you, I've noticed eyes more since the pandemic, since we're wearing masks and stuff. Is that has that enhanced your 
work with the with the eye or well it's an interesting thing i might answer that a little bit more obliquely i'd say that the eyes and the relationship of the eyes the nose and the mouth are the things that determine who it is and when your phone picks up and does the identification it's seeing the relationship of the eyes to your nose and mouth. That's what the markers are. It's triangulating. Mm -hmm. So I always knew that uh, from back in my college days, where if I photocopied and then photocopied a photocopy and photocopied that keep on going down, that relationship that it could be 15 generations down, that if you still had that relationship, you could tell who that is. Everything else blurs away, but that relationship is really strong. So I did really focus on eyes and lips, to mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. And that, that became where if I'm doing a face, I'm going to spend the majority of my time on the, those aspects. And the larger I could make the eyes, the better, because number one, it's easier. And I could really get detail into them. And there would just be aspects by moving the grains of frit powder around that makes it from being a happy eye to a more pensive eye. And that's where I'd say, I'm going to work on that. And even doing uh, Christina, she has, and I, I do notice them. I start saying she actually has uh, different colors in her eyes. She has almost like a stripe of golden color going through her eyes in one direction. And the other eye, it kind of goes almost horizontally across. And even though I'm not trying to do hers, I wanted to incorporate that into the piece I'm doing just because I found it to be an interesting quality. And, and I do pay attention to eyes and fashions about eyebrows and how they are arched over or they're not, that, that they want the big bushier Kardashian kind of eyebrows. I mean, I start paying attention to things I probably never would be able to expand, expand on before, but now I'm aware of and I look at and I will just say I like that. And, and since I wear glasses, I understand I am when I see people with glasses, you have a shield in front of it, but you could also say it does frame your eyes differently when you have a different frame. And because of masks and stuff, you are kind of blocked from seeing other relationships and aspects. So I, I don't say that I focus on them more. I just feel like I'm missing part of the story. So I don't include, I don't like that when it comes to seeing a movie or if I see a TV show that was filmed in 2020 and they consciously put on masks i feel like i'm missing so much because of how the mask is but i do like to look at eyes and i do have a, a whole little um, stash of uh, eyeball images that i use as reference points as i work on it because sometimes i'll want a wider eye and to me i don't care about the uh origin line of saying that this figure that i'm using as the genesis I will cut apart eyes and put them in there. I will have them open. I will close them. And I just say, it's part of my story. But if I'm going to be using an eye, I want to have an eye that I'm referencing as I make it. So I have a whole little catalog of eyes and lips. And I can go back and forth and say, really, I like the fullness of those lips. Or I like the, the way that their eye kind of tapered down. And just that little, uh, the connection, I don't know what the fold will be when you have it joined together but i really like to explore that in detail and and i'm up close and personal i'm doing it grain at a time to say that forms the bottom curve but i do pay attention to eyes when i watch it on tv and they go in for the close-up i just think of the anatomy of the eye and how it actually is a fold up and that's where the white line would be and is it is their eyelid on the bottom covering their pupil or is it well below it because sometimes you'll see actors with enormous eyes and i just figure like you're a freak of nature, but that works for viewing because it's so much more expressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Wow. I would love to see your notebooks. Oh, <laughs> Do you tend to fill the notebooks with your images and drawings and ideas? I, well, I, I am not a purist. I don't keep anything, <laughs> as you see, just like a big mess pile. And I stack them up for a while and then at a certain point they'll fall over and then someone will say, do I need to keep this? Can I clean around here? And then I'll just make the decision of it's time. It's I haven't looked at that pile since 2007. Yeah, it's time for it to go. And I, I can't store everything. We're a shared studio. We have each one of us are pack rats and we actually have mice that live in them. So I got to get rid of them. 
And, and actually the, the artwork is behind me. I just was cleaning it out and I was discovering at the bottom, all this mouse poop. So the mice have been living between the pieces and pooping there. And it's like, ugh, you know, because we have roller shutter doors, we're near a pond. And so they come in during the winter and they nest. And that's why I'm saying you can't have food on your tables. You can't leave snacks around because it's food. And there's too many in a shared studio. You just got to deal with everyone. And we did have snakes come in one spring and that freaked everyone out so much more than the mice. And I'm saying the snakes are eating the mice. Yeah. So I don't want to have, when they say we should get a studio cat, I'm saying there's so many toxins around here. Every one of these firing elements in the kiln, they're bad to breathe. I don't want to subjugate a cat to be licking on it. So I can't say that I want to have an animal subjugated to that. And then if I put out mice traps, they all blame me for killing a mouse. No. <laughs> we have the same problem sometimes. And we have a resident snake in the stone tower. We don't have any mice anymore. <laughs> I, I'm happy with all of it. I'm happy with spiders because I say they get rid of the bugs. And we get a lot of bugs around here. And I don't like mosquitoes. I don't want anything else. So I just, I'm happy with a spider. But if they're all freaked out, I'll take it outside and let it go. And, and living in Australia, you got these, you got spiders that are this size. And remember that first time that we saw that and my wife came back in and said, there's a spider in the hallway. And I said, okay, she goes, no, there's a spider in the hallway. And I said, we'll go around it. Because if I hear a thump and being dragged up the stairs, I better come out and save her. So I described it at work saying, there's this big spider. And so that's a huntsman. That's a baby one that you're describing. And saying, yeah, yeah, it can, it can get like a cat, these spiders. And so I've learned to say, spiders, that's nothing. That's, you don't know what spiders are. Yeah, Australia is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> like every animal is deadly there in some way or another. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any other questions for Michael before we can let him go and enjoy the rest of his weekend? Oh, Elizabeth. I want to. I can't I find the raise your hand button on the thing. <laughs> um, no, I, I absolutely love your work. It's it's gorgeous and it's fascinating to me because it's so different um, from what you normally see in the art world. Um, do you sell any of your work locally or does the school have a little studio shop or? We have a bit of a gallery in the front of the studio. I, 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 I do sell locally right now. Uh, I don't have anything in DC, Baltimore. We brought, hmm. we worked with the Coppin State University and it was the first glass show that Baltimore had since 1996. And we got some of the biggest names who are Baltimore based. So uh, Joyce Scott, if you don't know her, you should look her up. She's a MacArthur Genius Grant Award winner for her work with uh, glass beads. And she tells very troubled stories within her works, like jewelry piece that says the day after rape, you know, that kind of a quality to it. So it's like, what a great thing to be part of. So being part of that show was an important thing for us to do, to be able to say we brought it to Baltimore since they don't normally focus on that. DC, however, unless there's the open studio at the glass school, because my gallery closed I and mean, the art world is changing. All of the places that normally used to be venues for me have gone away. I used to show at um, uh, Fraser Gallery in Bethesda. I showed at, uh, I used to be part of Studio Gallery in the district and I was part of Maureen Littleton in Georgetown. But, you know, everything, the gallery system was shifting as the internet took over. And then with the pandemic, a lot of places just closed up. And so it's it's just a different world. And that's why things like the uh, uh, art online kind of thing that you guys are doing is the only way to connect up with people and talk about art because it's all gone digital. And if it's not, and if you haven't made a shift there, you're gonna have a problem. And that's why, in fact, as the big shows for art now are gonna be at the big art fairs. So if you're in, Miami, Art Miami, or if you're in New York at one of the, the New York fairs, you, you need to be there to be seen by the big markets. And you're going to have more people at Art Miami that would see your work than would ever walk through a gallery anyway. And we do have a, a thing, a small space here in our studio that if you just popped in, you can probably go around and take a look at what people in our studio are doing. Because again, everyone has a different voice. Everyone has a different way of talking about it. Tim has done a lot where he's 
uh, done experimentation with different media, electronics, uh, lenticulars, plastics, all sorts of things within his work. Irwin does a lot with recycling. Um, you have Patricia who does a lot with enamel painting and glass. So you just have different ways that people are doing it. And if we're at the spring and at the winter open studios, usually the stuff is up and there right now, we had our spring open studio. We had a big show here with, um, uh, trying to think of who that was. It was a huge show we had in our studio because the Renwick Museum had their anniversary show and opening of a new exhibit. So we had done a tie-in where they had lunch with all the artists who were coming in for the Smithsonian at our studio. So we had it set up to be a big to-do show here, but now that's weeks away uh, in the past. And now it's gone back to a a thing where it gets pulled apart for a show that Irwin's showing in, in Baltimore and then he has other shows. So what's on the wall gets yanked down and being delivered to another place. I'm gonna be driving to Pittsburgh tomorrow to drop off artwork. And I find that it's hard to show in DC because it's, it's where I sold in DC, Maureen Littleton will have a story about how she sells in DC, but she has to go to Chicago to sell to DC collectors because they don't buy it. They won't go to her gallery and look at it. They'll go to Chicago and look at it there and buy it. And then she has to drive it back and then drive it to their place in Bethesda. So she's saying, why am I doing this? Why am I doing anything? Why am I paying Georgetown rent if they will only see it when I'm doing the fairs? Right. When is a good time to come visit your studios? Well, Are there not better a, days than others? Well, I'd say not at 1030 on a morning on a Saturday because I... <laughs> Um, no, I'm sorry if I was rude to that guy because I no, just no. couldn't yeah. believe that he kept on knocking. Uh, but I would say that we're here in our studio usually from around 10 a.m. to around 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then on the weekends, if there's a class, if you look it up the glass school online, you'll see when classes are. And that's kind of randomized because it's based on if there's a class, there's going to be someone here. If not, there's probably not. And otherwise, I just kind of, you take your chances. And if someone is in the studio or they're not in the middle of setting up something in the kiln, they're probably going to say, yeah, come on in. You want to look around, just be nosy. Sure. I mean, that, really, that is kind of what you want. You just want to be nosy. You don't really want to be looking at a gallery. You want to kind of walk up and say, what's, what's this? And then have them talk about it. And then you go, oh, that's cool. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Last questions for our guest? Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. Wonderful so presentation. Much. We're very grateful for you taking the time with us this Saturday morning. And um, our next uh, Saturday morning will be in two weeks. And I don't think we have anything on, on Tuesday this week, correct, Marianne? Oh no, no, not yet. But I will, I am hearing know. knocks on our door too, so I better go. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Sometimes we have demonstrations. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much, Michael. This was uh, unusually exciting and uh, <laughs> edifying. Thank you. And everybody is saying thank you. And ah, very interesting. Uh, showing their admiration. Thank Thanks. you My so pleasure. much. Thank you That's all for really coming nice. as well. Okay. And we have it recording. I'll be announcing where it's posted. Thank you again. Fantastic. Pleasure. Have Thanks, a guys. wonderful day. Okay. Bye, everyone.